itself. And uh, here's the problem. I'm holding this cookie and I'm, there's no good moment while I'm up here to actually eat this cookie. You want to hold this cookie? Absolutely. You, yeah, he's, bo- yeah, he's borrowing it. He's not borrowing that. He's, yeah. uh, welcome to Telios, a church where people borrow your cookies. So <laughs> we're glad to have you here tonight. Uh, tonight's a little bit different. We usually do a study through the Bible, looking for Jesus in every book of the Bible. But tonight, we are going to do a little update. We're going to update on some ministries that um, we as a church are involved in. And some of them are within the one, one we're going to talk about tonight is in the United States, or actually it happened in Canada, but it's in North America. And another one is actually happening in South America. And so we'll talk about both of those this evening. Um, as we start out tonight, it's just amazing for the Lord to be so gracious to each one of us. You know, as we, as we get to this part of the day, right, you know, almost seven o'clock now and just thinking about how the Lord has just been with you this whole day, the whole day, you know, how gracious he is for each one of us. And I'm so thankful for, um, for our fellowship here, for God to not just um, bless us so that we could just, okay, we're just making it, but he allows us to be able to serve other people as well. And that is such a blessing because then we are following in the footsteps of our Savior. It, it can't be all about us. We have we are called to serve others. And so tonight I pray that you'll be encouraged by some of the things going on. Um, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask Cole and Taylor to come on up here and they're just going to share a little bit about um, Young Life and what they were doing this last summer. So if you'd agree with me in a word of prayer. Papa, thank you so much for for bringing us here today. Thank you amongst this whole day how you you led us and you, you were walking in front of us this day. Thank you that you walking in front of us has led us here tonight. We pray this evening that you would be honored and glorified. And as we see and hear testimonies, that we would be absolutely in awe of what you do. And God, I pray that you would always keep us mindful of what goes on beyond the borders of Humboldt County, of a world of people that you love. Whether we're able to go there personally or not, that we would always be mindful of it, and we would always be praying. So encourage us this evening. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So first up, I'm going to invite uh, Taylor and Cole to come on up here. Can we give them a Telios welcome here? Taylor and Cole. All right. There you go. Give you that. Give you that. And so here we go. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about what happened this summer. I'm going to be back here running screens and also asking you questions at random. So what happened this summer? What happened this summer? (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Can you hear me now? What happened this summer? Um, A lot happened this summer, but um, I had the chance to serve for my second summer as a mountain guide up at Beyond Malibu, which is a Young Life camp in British Columbia, um, way out in the boonies. Um, I got to take high school kids out into the mountains of British Columbia and talk to them about Jesus and get to hear their life stories and get to be wrapped up in all of the relationship that they built with their friends and with each other and with their Young Life leader. And it's a very honored position, I think, to get to peer into that without having um, done the work that their Young Life leader had done with them of, like, getting to know them and getting them there. I just got to be a part of it and get to experience that depth um, and witness it firsthand and simultaneously keep them safe in the mountains and show them things out there. Um, But that's what I did. Cole had a different role. I was not off running around in the mountains a whole lot. I spent most of my summer in base camp. I was working on the maintenance team, um, basically just making it so that the camp could keep running, um, so that the guides could do the more um, kind of frontline work with the kids. Um, I was more behind the scenes, making sure camp had power, making sure it was clean. Um, so just kind of still working for the Lord, but in a less obvious role. So yeah, that's what I spent my summer doing. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Well, there'll be more. 
Okay, great. <laughs> um, so I guess a little backstory on how I got up there. Um, Tay, like she said, was a mountain guide last summer and um, this most recent one. Um, but I had never even heard of this little camp called Beyond Malibu um, until probably the beginning of December um, when I heard Tay talking about it with um, another person who um, comes to the church when he's back from college, Jacob Clark. Um, and I just was kind of passing by and she's like, oh, you should sign up for this place. You'd probably like it. You could work on the maintenance team. And I was like, well, <laughs> I have nothing else to do this summer. That's like super pressing. And I'm like, okay. So I applied and there I was at the beginning of June um, on my way up to Canada. So yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, also, I guess, a little into why it's called Beyond Malibu. There's a Young Life camp up um, on the Princess Louisa Inlet where we were um, called Malibu Club. And it's kind of a more typical Young Life camp capacity for like 400 kids, something like that. Um, definitely like a bigger affair. Um, and then, I have no idea what year they decided to do it. Um, they decided to... Uh, sometime in the 70s, apparently, um, they went about two miles further down the inlet and created this tiny little camp um, that has capacity for like 70 kids. Um, and from there, they decided to um, take kids out on a number of different routes in the area. I think there's, what, eight different routes? Yeah, there's eight right now. Um, and yeah, it'd be a team of guys taking anywhere between like seven and 15 kids up um, on a week-long trip um, where they could kind of get to experience the Lord in a way that you don't ordinarily get to. Um, it's definitely, um, I had the opportunity to actually go up as a participant on one of the trips, and it's definitely, um, there's a lot of conditions up there where it's like you are climbing up a seemingly vertical rock face, and it's pouring rain, and you're like, I don't know how I'm going to make it up to the top. And you just, it's definitely a lot more about relying on the Lord and understanding that he is there with you. Um, so yeah, it's just a very unique experience. Do you have anything to say? <laughs> no, I have like a story I could share, but we can do that after. If you want. No, share your story. Please do. Okay. Well, that involves my pictures. So um, it's kind of hard to wrap up a whole three months well, actually six months if we're including last summer, of what it's like out there um, in the mountains. But I wanted to share the story of my first trip with campers this summer because I think it was really formative and it kind of set the tone for the way the rest of my summer went. Um, so if you could put the, so that's my group. They were actually from Ventura, California. I'm the one in the ridiculous hat and my guide partner is the one in the green helmet. Her name's Abby. A uh, little tiny group. Uh, the kids, we get a little bit of background from them, from their leaders, which kind of tells us where they're at with the Lord. Um, and a lot of these kids were just on the fence, really questioning. They, they wanted to believe, and they went to church, but they're like, but how can this be? And just so many questions that they're like, I don't, I, there's no answer that I can find, and I'm, I need an answer. And so you can go to the next slide if you want to, if you want. So, um... The way that that trip actually worked out, so they got to base camp, it's pouring rain, and you gotta be like super peppy, because they're terrified, they're like, why is it dumping rain, I'm about to climb a mountain. They're like, it's gonna be fine, it'll clear up. <laughs> it's not going to, it's not. Um, so it's dumping rain, and we, you know, we have dinner there, we go over fears and expectations, and um, the, then we hit the trail the next day, and it's actually pretty sunny, there's some overcast. Um, and so we're going up, we're talking to these kids and just doing trail talk. You walk in a single file line, so you can really only talk to the kid like directly behind you or in front of you. Um, and I was talking to one of the boys who really was struggling with his faith, didn't have a great relationship with his parents, and just kind of hearing his story. Um, and then the second day, it's cloudy again, and we just broke tree line in this photo, and there's the mountain in that you can kind of see behind the clouds is Mount Albert. 
And this was the first time they ever got a view. So it was like a huge moment of rejoicing once we got up to the top. They're like, oh my God, you can actually see. Because at this point, they're really uh, frustrated because they've been going vertical with 40 pounds on their back for a whole day now. And they're like, okay, when are we going to see something cool? And then the clouds parted. Um, so that was a really cool moment. And then, um, so that was day two. And then day three, I don't know what the next slide is, but you can go to the... Oh, perfect. That is from a campsite. It's my favorite campsite. It's called Maury's Mound. Um, and the sky is totally cleared up. We had a gorgeous sunset. The kids were stoked. Um, we had dinner, just hearing more of their stories, still kind of getting to know them because it's day three. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. This was, OK, this was after they had passed snow school. So we have to do something called snow school, which is basically teaching the kids how to save themselves if they start sliding down a snow pitch with an ice axe, um, how to use it safely. And so they have to be able to demonstrate all of the different ways to like roll and depending on which orientation you fall in. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. This was them. We had, they had a whole graduation ceremony. We dubbed them with our ice axes, and they were really proud of themselves, and they should have been. Um, I, in the background, you can see that there's some clouds up in the sky. and. A lot of those clouds were mare's tails, and I don't know if you are familiar with like weather patterns, but mare's tails usually 100% of the time always indicate a storm coming in 24 to 48 hours. So I see them, I'm, eh, whatever, maybe it'll hold out. And so we go up to our next campsite, and we got there okay. Uh, it's called Miner's Rock. It's the campsite right before the summit uh, of Sun Peak. And, um, we set up our tents and we're eating dinner in the fly and just dump, dumping, pouring rain down on us. The wind is ripping through. We're trying to listen to a kid's life story and like our fly, it's just this yellow tent with no bottom and it has like a pole in the middle that holds it up and it by tension. And so the the wind's ripping through and it's unzipping our our door and it's just flapping and we're like. No, just talk a little louder. It's fine. Don't worry about the weather. And you can tell they're getting anxious because summit day is tomorrow. And we're like, it's fine. It, don't worry. It, it was not fine. But it's OK. So um, they go to bed. We're like, you know, we'll, we'll make a decision tomorrow. Don't worry about it. You guys are fine in your tents. Just guy them out really well. Make sure they're not going anywhere. And then my guide partner, Abby, and I wake up to, we sleep in the fly. The kids sleep in the tents. Uh, I wake up to the sound of the fly just and it's just water. And I am like, OK, Lord. So I open up my bivy, and I pop out of my little like sleeping bag and just slapped in the face immediately with a wet tent fly door. And I'm like, cool, OK, <laughs> right on. And then my guide partner, she's this is her first experience with campers ever. Um, she pops out, and she looks at me like, what do I do? Our tent pole is like this. And so I'm like, we're going to drop the fly. We're going to go in the tent with camp the campers. And it's like probably 4 or 5 AM. So she's like, OK. So we get out, and we're like running with our sleeping bags in hand, banging on the girls' tent, like, let us in. And then we get in, and we're like, we're just going to wait it out. Maybe the storm will pass, and we can summit, or whatever. So we bring the kids breakfast in the tent, and we're sitting there, and time's just kind of ticking by. And I kind of know we're not going to summit at this point, which is OK. We kind of break the news to the kids, and they're like, you know, I don't really want to go out there anyway. So we're like, great, that's fine. Um, and you can click over to the next one. So we got, we were waiting for a break in the rain. We had all been playing cards in one tent. So there's nine of us in a five person tent just playing cards for hours and like talking to each other. And um, so we hear a break in the rain. We're like, okay, go. We're going to go get a summit picture now. And so we run out there. You can see there's no view whatsoever. Um, that's, that's what a whiteout looks like. So that's me and the yellow Crocs and our campers. Um, and this is, I think the last photo that I have, I might have one more, but I think that that's it. Or is that it? Is yeah, there one, one more? more? Oh, you can go to that. Oh, well, actually, yeah, that's fine. OK, so that those are my last two photos of that trip, because after we got into the tent, we were listening to um, another life story from one of the students. And my guide partner and I hear thunder. And we're like, oh, maybe it's just a rock ball. And we just kind of ignore it. And um, then we see a flash, and I start counting. And five seconds goes by, and you can hear the thunder again. And you're like, OK. Um, for anybody that isn't familiar with lightning, the closer the interval is between the time you see the flash and hear the thunder, closer the storm is to you, five-second interval is about a mile. 
Um, we're also at our most exposed campsite. It's a flat granite slab. The last thing you want to be is the tallest thing in a lightning storm. <laughs> and that's kind of what we were. So I'm like, all right, guys, I know it's going to stink really bad. We're going to get our foamies. We're going to go sit out in a lightning drill. So we're all like five feet apart, sitting on a foamy, just like shivering. And I'm like, it's OK, guys. Like, <laughs> you know, try to like cheer them up. And I'm, I'm pretty nervous at this point. I'm supposed to be, you know, kind of the lead guide in this scenario. and. I'm like, this is this is the only thing I can do is prevent multiple people getting injured at once. Um, and so I didn't hear anything for about 20 more minutes. So I'm like, okay, guys, they're like shivering. I don't want them to get hypothermic. So I put them back in the tents, get in your sleeping bag, or we're just going to hang out. And then as soon as we get in our bags, flash, counting, three seconds, thunder. I'm like, all right. Now we're going to sing. So my guide partner and I are both terrified. We're trying not to let our campers know. And we're just singing worship music at the top of our lungs. I have a camper that's crying next to me. I'm like, Lord, come on. Like, Ooh. This went on for, with three to four second intervals for about an hour and a half of just being caught in a lightning storm at the campsite before our summit. <laughs> like, the, the worst place you could be, uh, except for maybe on the summit. And it was honestly, I think, one of the most transformative experiences of my life. I was only in the girls' tent, but we, we got together after the storm. Um, an interesting thing is that the girl that was crying ended up falling asleep in the middle of that storm. And the only thing I could think about was um, when Jesus was asleep in the boat during the storm. I'm like, wow. My most terrified camper just fell asleep in the middle of all of this. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So once everything cleared off, after you know an hour or two, we all get back into the boys' tent. So all nine of us are together to kind of debrief the situation. And the boys were the ones that were the most skeptical, really struggling with their faith. And we talked about, like, okay, what did you guys do? We were singing, didn't know if you could hear us. And they were like, uh, so their leader was in there. His name's Max. And he said, well, you know, um, one of the students pulled out the Bible. And it wasn't his Bible. It was actually my guide partner's Bible. And it's funny that it was that one because hers is the only one that had an index in the back of like topical stuff. And he looked up storm and he just went straight to the, the story of Jesus calming the storm. And he read it at the top of his lungs to the guys that were in the tent, to his leader, and they just talked about it. And it was like they got to have this incredible, beautiful moment that I wasn't even there to witness. Um, but we talked more about it together and a little bit about Job 38 I mentioned because I was thinking of the song Where Were You. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with that. But there's a line in it that says... Um, like from God's perspective to Job, like does the lightning ask you where it should strike? Just kind of reminding that he is sovereign. Um, and so from that moment, I think it was interesting because I was getting really disappointed and that I couldn't like get these kids their summit experience like on the mountain like they came here to do. Um, but just being reminded that the Lord knew what they needed and what experience they needed to have on the mountain. And on the way down, um, we talked more about it. I mean, that was like the topic of the week, I'm, you know, rightly so. But um, at the end of the week, they get to share um, at club so that, you know, the people that work behind the scenes can hear about what happened on the mountain. And one of the kids, um, his name was Sage, he had the most questions. He went up there, and the thing that he shared was that he learned that he didn't necessarily need to have all of his questions answered in order to trust the Lord. And so that was super powerful to hear that. Like, my guide partner and I just started crying. Like, we're sitting on the tarp. The kids were like, mm, you know, like, you came through, Lord. And I don't know why I'm surprised by that, you know? Um, but yeah, lots of lessons there. I can give you the four-hour version sometime if you want. But that was just a really powerful experience that I got to have. The rest of the summer, the weather was pretty much the same. Just really bad, really um, bad. But really good things came out of it. And really good bonding time and uh, moments with God, so... That's my story. Sorry, that was really long-winded. Taylor, I got a question. So okay. um, how many weeks was it that you were there? You said three months each year? Yeah. Yes. And then how many groups? One Is it one a week? Like you start down at, you know, at what yeah. looks like in this picture of it's like nice it's shorts and everything. Yes. And then you end up in someplace like this. Mm -hmm. that, so yeah. how long How long from like from there to the top? How long does that take? Um. So we... Start hiking on Sunday, and summit day is Wednesday. So it takes three days, three or four go, days. To go from this picture to, to this the picture. summit. Well, that's actually day to To, to go from three. To here, to this summit. That's day three. So that's not the summit, because we didn't get to summit. 
Okay. So if you go to my last photo, the, the mountain that you see in the background, that's Sun Peak. So we do that hike in a day. You go there and you go back. Um, that's the summit day for Sun Peak. So that picture is from Miner's Rock. That takes three days. And then summit day is the fourth. And that's not a campable summit because it's like really small. But yeah. To give a little reference, um, so all the groups start at sea level, um, as re seen by that picture over there, the other one. Um, and then the highest mountain was Mount Albert. It's about 8,300 feet. Um, the other ones are all between 6,200 and around 7,000 feet. So um, yeah, you're going up at least 6,000 feet in three days. So <laughs> it's a little bit of a hike. <laughs> and then you're yeah. back on Saturday? Yes. Back Friday, Friday afternoon. Friday. Yeah, two day descent. Two so day. then as a lead guide, you have a day to recoup and then a brand new group comes on Sunday? If you're on a back to back, which I had one this summer, yes. Um, you say goodbye to your groups, they leave Saturday morning and then you say hello to your new group that afternoon. Um, that is a little bit rough. Typically you have, they try to give you a week in between where you can be working at base camp and helping out there, planning for your next trip, um, planning content, being prayerful about it. Um, but sometimes it doesn't work out that way and they have to send another guide out on, an, on a back-to-back -back and it happens, um, but yes. So when you're on these, uh, Taylor, are you the, you said you're the lead guide. Are there any other guides with you? I have, yes, you have, you typically have at least one guide partner. That's kind of necessary. Um, so that's Abby. She's, uh, that was my position last year. It was the first year. You basically have all of the ministry related skills. The only thing that they're learning is group management in practice and the route knowledge, because they've never been on these mountains before. So the role as the lead guide is, at the beginning of the summer, is to teach good route knowledge and kind of show them how to group manage um, with campers. And then you kind of back off and let them take the lead towards the end. Um, so this was the first trip with campers of the season. So I was already kind of nervous, just like, I only had one guide partner. Sometimes you have two, so sometimes it'll be two second years with the first year or one second year and two first years, depends on the group needs. Um, but yeah, I had two person guide teams this summer, so it was me and Abby, and then I had one other guide partner. And what's the age range of the campers that you're taking? Um, honestly, we've gotten campers of all ages. Uh, typically it's high school students, but we've had father-son trips, mother-daughter trips. Last year I led a group with, um, the mother was actually the young life leader for her daughter and all of her friends. So she was in her 50s. She crushed it. It was awesome. Awesome. <laughs> All right. One, one more question, Taylor. Last okay. one for you here. Um, what, what are you going to miss most about serving the Lord this way, these last two years? What are you going to miss the most of it? Mm, that's hard. <laughs> um, my answer would probably be everything, but <laughs> the community there is really solid. You have a bunch of people who love the Lord and who love kids and want to bring kids to the Lord um, in a unique way where they're distraction free and get to witness the power of God firsthand. Um, I think that's actually, I think it's the, the lack of distractions um, and being able to really just be with God and to see kids for the first time be like, I'm kind of like, relieved I don't have my phone with me. I'm like, yeah, imagine that. <laughs> you know, it's because you get, they get to like hear things about each other for the first time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they've been friends for forever. And when we say that we're going to do life stories, they're like, I already know everything about, but they always walk away learning something new or being like, I had no idea that you went through that. And I don't know, it's just really powerful. Sorry, that probably was not a great answer. That's an excellent answer. <laughs> it, it's, it's actually caused me to ask another question. So, um, <laughs> How has that affected how you see serving now that you're back? Um, how are you different? Am I different? After going through this um, experience over the last two years? I think it's really hard to um, have a summer beyond and not be different coming out of it. Yeah. Um, I think when I see people now, I'm a lot more curious about the rest of what got them there. Um, I think before, and I think many of us struggle with it, but I did, was like seeing somebody and just kind of assuming their life story or like assuming based off of what they look like or what they're wearing or how they're carrying themselves, what their past was like. Like, oh, like that, I know that, I know that type, but no, I don't. 
And I, that was proven to me time and time again was God was like, your first impression of people is usually wrong. And so walking out of my last two summers there, I think I am trying really hard to see people with like, I have no idea about your past and I want to. Um, yeah. That, that's probably the biggest way that I've noticed that I'm different. Awesome. Thank you so much, Taylor. Cole, can you please? Oh, yeah. That's absolutely yes. Cole, you have the floor. How do we eat? Oh, you carry it. Um, it's dehydrated food mostly, and they're prepared by two girls. They're food packers. They pack all of the meals, so breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, for every trip that goes out. Um, they, they pack it all. It's measured based off of the gender of who's in the group and how many there are. And then we take two big pots out and two whisper light stoves and we boil water and we cook it. Hmm? Yep. It's easier on the way back. It's just bags. <laughs> so I guess kind of start things off for me. Um, the picture, it's like the group picture. Can you pull that one up actually? Probably should have told you this beforehand. Um, so that right there was most of the people that we spent the summer with um, were missing probably 15 because they had to leave early for school or something like that. Um, all the way over on um, the right side there, uh, that's Rob Diker. He was the camp director. He's been doing that for like, I think, 31 years. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's just kind of the mix, base camp staff and guides. Um, and it was really cool being up there because um, when you spend three months with a group that small and you don't really see a whole lot of other people or you don't really get to know a lot of other people during that time, um, you are kind of forced to develop relationships with them because if they're being a little vulnerable with you and you're not being vulnerable back, it just sort of makes this weird situation. And so it, like whether you want to or not, you're going to kind of like <laughs> let cats out of the bag and uh, you develop some really solid relationships um, and it's just a really cool experience. Um, yeah, my summer was not um, it, very different from Tay's. Um, so like I said, I spent most of my summer in base camp, um, but because of that, I developed a really close relationship with um, three people specifically. One of them you can kind of see in the um, picture there, he's in the back row wearing the hat and the blue shirt, um, kind of like, I think, four in from the, I guess I can't, right side. Um, I'm having a hard time right now. That's Eli. He was the base camp um, coordinator. He was the one that was kind of handing out jobs. He was unofficially the head of the maintenance team. Um, just a really solid leader, really awesome guy. Um, there was also Josh, um, who I can't find in that picture right now. Um, but he was a guy from Singapore, actually, who um, moved to the States to go to school and then ended up finding about finding out about Beyond and coming up on the maintenance team. And then another guy, his name was Chad. Um, he's not in the picture. He had to leave earlier for school. Um, but it was just, the experience for me was just sort of watching God bring people from all over the place. Like I said, guy from Singapore, we had people from Louisiana, from Texas, from Alaska, from New York, like all over the place and just bringing them together to this little place in the middle of nowhere in Canada and using them to do some really powerful work. Um, but yeah, so um, if you want to just start running through pictures, I can start rattling off little things. So that right there is a picture of me when I was out on trail for my week. Um, that was at our first campsite called Saddle Before the Bowl. Um, but that was, uh, let's see, was that our, no, that was our second campsite, sorry. Um, so we'd broken tree level and uh, we'd gotten there that night or that evening and I was, I was looking out and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And uh, one of the other girls on the trip, she took that picture of me, so yeah. Um, that there is on the way up towards Saddle Before the Bowl. Um, we had stopped for lunch that day and uh, at a place called Teddy's Knoll. Um, and actually, I guess I can give a little backstory now before I talk about something. I um, talk about something later. 
while we were there for lunch, um, our guides had given us the task to um, write something. And it was based off of a passage in Amos, um, which I will read to you now is Amos 4.13. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind and declares to man what is his thought, who makes the morning darkness and treads on the heights of the earth, the Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. So they had just told us to kind of write our own version of that. Um, and so that was where we did that. Um, and then we carried on on our hike after lunch. Uh, Want to go to the next one? That is also from Saddle Before the Bull. Um, the route that I went on was called Long Perks. It was the only route that doesn't have a summit day um, because we are walking along a ridge and that is one of the parts of the ridge that we walked along. Um, we didn't actually get up onto that kind of twisty part there because um, there was no like real access to that. Um, but we kind of hiked next to that and then up a little bit behind it. Um, yeah, and on the kind of bottom area there, just below that little snow that, or above the snow that you see there um, is a glacier. And we got to traverse that wearing like spikes on our boots and stuff like that. Um, kind of cool. Uh, you want to go to the next one? That's called Chatterbox Falls. Um, that is one of the top yachting destinations in the world, but I was like two miles away from where we were camp, like in base camp. Um, so it was really cool. We had opportunities to go over there on kayaks, just take a day, like when we had our Sabbath, which was just sort of a day off. Um, a lot of people would like to go over there and just hang out, look around. Uh, next one. That's also from, that's basically from below the falls looking out towards the inlet. Um, yeah. And that there is probably my favorite picture from this summer. Um, that's from base camp. That was um, in the evening. I was sitting on a bench um, just listening to some music, having some time to myself. And uh, I did doctor that one just a little bit, um, kind of brighten the colors. Um, but yeah, that was pretty much what I was seeing from where I was sitting. Um, and it just sort of reminded me like, this is what creation looks like. This is what the Lord has made. Um, and it was just, it was really cool being able to live for three months surrounded by such raw, unadulterated creation. Um, that's also um, same kind of picture, but that was after it had rained. Um, it stopped, it started to clear up a little bit. And um, that mountain in the background, it was called Arthur. Um, and well, yeah, technically that's Arthur's buttress. Arthur is behind it. But um, yeah, that was the mountain that um, it's sort of like the symbol of beyond almost. It's <laughs> what you see from base camp. So yeah. this gym. <laughs> um, yeah, if you want to go to the next one. So this right here um, is at a place called Potato Pass. Um, we went along one ridge and then we dipped down into Potato Pass, went across it. Um, my group actually camped in Potato Pass, which is not something that groups normally do, but just because of the pace we were moving, we had to camp there um, before we went up the side of it um, onto another ridge the next day. Um, yeah, if you want to move on to the next one. Um, and this, I believe, was um, just below what Taylor said was her favorite campsite, um, Maury's Mound. Um, it was just kind of a cool picture. Up in the background there, you can see um, there's like one ridge right there in kind of the front. And then just behind it, you can barely see the tips of something called the bat wings, which were uh, below uh, Mount Albert. If you want to go to the next one. This was on our way down um, uh, at a place called uh, Broken Tools, what they called the campsite, because when they were building um, what they called a BIF there, um, BIF stands for bathroom and forest floor, um, they broke, I think it was a shovel, two hammers, and a saw or something like that. So yeah, uh, you want to move on to the next one. Um, and this was also from base camp, um, sort of like those other pictures that I took like facing out, but just to the left. Um, this was the day after I'd gotten back off trail. We'd had some rain that night, and then uh, in the morning, I just like was walking down towards the dock. I looked to the left and saw that. It was just like, whoa. <laughs> it's, it's, whenever I see the God rays like that, it's just sort of it's a reminder that like God is right there. He's never far away. So, um, Another picture of the same thing. I love that view so much, so I took a lot of pictures of it. 
Um, and this right here, so kind of what I was saying earlier about um, we were tasked with writing something. So one of the days, this was at that place called Potato Pass. Um, we had some time in the morning before we started hiking to just go have, it was supposed to be like 20, 30 minutes to yourself. Um, I walked down below the campsite a little ways, um, kind of past where the other people had chosen to go sit by themselves. And I like saw this view and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. But I bet it'd be really like even cooler from down there. So I like walked down a little ways, set up my um, little like camp chair thing that I had and was sitting there and I'm like, hmm, it's probably a really good view from right down there. So I walked down a little ways and then I'm like, hmm, what about down there? So I walked down a little bit. It ended up that after they called the end, like they yelled out that it was the end of quiet time, like 15 minutes later they found me. So, um, but yeah, while I was down there, um, I added to the thing that they had had me start writing. Um, and what I ended up writing um, was just sort of, I wasn't thinking about what I was writing. It was, it was like God was expressing himself to me in a format that um, just kind of made sense because I'd spent the summer, um, a lot of the summer, just reading through the book of Psalms. And uh, yeah, so this is just kind of what came out of that, um, sort of a, a prayer that I would always be looking to God, always be looking to serve him and glorify him in everything I do. So um, here goes. He who carves valleys and raises mountains out of the depths, the one who sets wonder in the heart of man and lays paths beneath his feet, who brightens the sun to bring joy to his people and darkens the clouds to bring life to creation, the one whose voice is thunder and whose majesty cannot be contained. He is the Lord, the King of kings, the great I am, whose name will be praised long after the mountains crumble and the earth gives way. Blessed be the man who cries out beside the rocks, who praises the Lord God from the mountaintop and the valley. He who searches the heart of man and knows the depths of his soul, the one who gives breaths, breath to his lungs and watches tirelessly both day and night, who gives love overwhelmingly and asks only love in return, the one who opens doors and shuts them, whose mercy and compassion are unending. He is the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth, the one who was and is and is to come, whose glory burns away the sins of man and is lifted high by the mighty cherubim and seraphim. Blessed be the man who lifts his eyes to follow the Lord and knows that all power and knowledge and time, that every good thing is in the heart of God. The mountains stand as testament to the power of the Lord. The oceans roar and rage by the will of God, and the trees lift their arms to praise the Most High. The birds of the sky sing songs of worship, and the creatures of the sea jump for joy at his passing. The wind dances in an endless fury, or an endless display of overwhelming love and righteous fury, and storms proclaim the majesty of the sovereign God with tongues of lightning and voices of thunder. All of creation cries out to lift high the name of the Lord forever, that he would be glorified. May the heart of man take heed of this chorus, and know that the Lord will reign from eternity past until eternity future. O oh Lord, may my life be a joyous sight in your eyes, a sweet taste in your mouth, a living, passionate song for you until my days on this earth are through. May my last breath proclaim that you are my king. Amen. And so yeah, that was just sort of kind of the culmination of my experience over the summer. Um, and yeah, I'm ready to go back. <laughs> hey, so Cole, I got a question. Um, how has that changed you as you're now back here in Humboldt County? So I think a lot of um, what Tay was saying so resonates with me. I am very quick to just look at a person and be like, oh, you're going to be that kind of person. And God was just like, no, you, you really don't know. Um, one of the guys who ended up, um, I mentioned him earlier, his name was Chad. Um, the first day I saw him was... We were still at a place called Egmont, which is where we got on a boat and went out to beyond Malibu. Um, I saw him just like chatting up a storm with a bunch of the girls that were there. And I'm like, oh, you're going to be that kind of guy, like the Mr. Cool guy. <laughs> like, 
I, I just like stereotyped him immediately. And he ended up being the person that I connected with probably better than I've ever connected with anyone in my life. So um, God was just sort of over and over showing me like, hey, you need to like, like wait and see what I have for you. Um, what this person is like, how they're going to impact your life. Um, and so coming back, it's just sort of been a lot of like, I'll see someone and I'm like, oh, that's what this is going to be like. And then I have to tell myself like, no, what if there's something else? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, before you guys go, uh, I'm going to ask a good friend of mine whose name is also Jim, wonderful name. Jim, why don't you come on up here? And we want to pray for Taylor and Cole and for what the future holds and all of that. So here, can I grab that? Can you, yeah, give, give Jim that. You, know, you need that. Yeah, because there's people that are, say hi. They're, they're watching and they want to be able to hear you pray. So it's important. It's hard to agree when you can't hear. Because I want to touch you guys. Yeah. That's awkward. Okay. <laughs> Papa, I just want to say thank you so much for my friends and fellow leaders, Taylor and Cole, and just for the things that you were um, able to reveal to them over this last summer and Taylor last, uh, the summer prior. And um, I'm just so thrilled that they get to, uh, to be leading the kids in this area to, to know you that it's these two people that, um, that you're putting in front of kids to mm -hmm. share with uh, Thank you. share with them your love for them and the gospel and all that it means. Um, thank you for the depth of their relationship with you, that you've taken them levels deeper during that time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I'm really excited to learn from them um, and learn how to love people better too. So we thank you so much for their life, um, for their lives rather, and for for refusing to stop working in our lives and hearts mm -hmm. in order to reach other people for you. So we love you, thank you, and, and pray for your, um, for your strength for us to be bold in sharing your love. Thank you for their lives. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, you guys. Jim is, uh, he's one of the leaders of Young Life here in Humboldt County. Jim, what's your, what's your role? I always forget your role. You're just my friend, Jim, but. Uh... I, I, I once was the head leader, and then we got a staff person, and then we came in the end of the I have a terrible <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hey, if somebody wanted to get involved in Young Life or after seeing this, they've got some more questions, who can they talk to? Can they talk to you, Jim? Yeah. Can they talk to Taylor? Can they talk to Cole? Awesome. Yes. So they shouldn't leave without talking to you tonight is what you're saying, right? Perfect. <laughs> well, we're going to change um, from North America to South America here. And uh, I want to just share a little update of what's happening. Oh, no, let me, let me, I got one more. Man, I'm a note taker when people start talking. Like, all the good stuff starts coming to my mind, like, when they're talking. I'm like, oh, I should ask them this. I want you to know, church, like, the reason why we're showing this to you also is that you can have a heart for those when you hear about, oh, I'm, I'm leading people and they're, you know, for Young Life or I'm serving um, high school students at Young Life. At least you have some idea of what goes on. Not everything is beyond Malibu and summiting peaks, but it's a work that God is using in a powerful way. So please keep that ministry in your prayer. I also want you to know you as a church are extremely generous towards Young Life um, in very practical ways, in prayer coverage and all of those things. And I just want you to know um, some of what was able to happen for Taylor and Cole and Young Life in our area is because of the generosity of your hearts. And I thought it was important for you to understand because sometimes we don't know like what, what, what happens like what you know I just I'm just being generous I'm giving my time and my finances and how does it impact people well it's impacted quite a few people just through Cole and Taylor Taylor how many um just would you say how many um campers would you say in the last two years have you uh, had an influence in going up and back and up and back approximately Eighty to ninety, right? And so those are eighty to ninety people you and I'll never see, and yet you had a direct impact in them. Well, I didn't give anything financially. If you prayed, then it had an impact. 
when they're up on the mountain, when they're up there and the lightning's hitting three seconds after, you know, yeah, God works. He works in powerful ways. So don't, I don't want any of us to discount how God does that and how God uses what we give. He doesn't ask for much, but what we give, he multiplies and he uses it in, in amazing ways. So if we take a little focus here and we go look at South America here, I want to um, uh, share a little bit about the church in Rio de Janeiro. Calvary Chapel of Rio is a church that we connected with when we were in Brazil just a few months ago. I went, my son Xander went, and Andre went. Uh, Andre leads worship. He was uh, leading this last Sunday. And um, we have been in correspondence with them because we as a church, we continue to pray for them. We continue to support them as well. And we were getting a few text messages. And I wanted to to read um, just a couple of things that were going on. Um, one was this. Uh, we There's a building... You know what, Don, let's just play the video because it's much easier because I don't want to take anything from Pastor Alex. Pastor Alex is a senior pastor of Calvary Chapel of Rio, and he's going to say a couple things, and I'll kind of fill in the gaps. That's what I'll do. So how about we dim the lights, and let's watch this from Pastor Alex. He recorded this yesterday, and I asked if he could just talk to us as a church. Hello, Pastor Tim, my friend Xander, my friend Andre, and all the brothers and sisters at Talios Christian Fellowship. My name is Alex and I'm a pastor here in Brazil, more specifically of Calvary Rio, Rio de Janeiro. And I'd like to talk to you guys about our outreach to Cidade de Deus, City of God, that Pastor Jim, Andre and Xander had a chance to meet. And I'd like to update you guys and talk about our project, what's going on there. About two years ago, we started reaching out to the children in the street, right in the middle of City of God. So lots of kids would come and we would just do like capoeira, do Bible studies and play and, and have fun with those kids. And the ministry started growing and, and we had the need for, for a shelter because sometimes it would rain or it would have like wars between the drug dealers and, and we had to cancel our project. And what happened is that about two months ago, some of the drug dealers that saw our work with the children they called one of our ladies there, Vanessa, and told her that they had a building that the, the city hall left in the city of God and, and the drug dealers took control of it. And they said, hey, you guys can use it if it is to reach out to the community. So what happened is that we got the keys from them and through Pastor Dim and the church and other people, we got some resources and we start repairing the building. So we painted the building, we clean it up, we put a bathroom, put doors. There's still a lot of work to be done. There's still a lot of things that needs to be done. But we are already using it, you know, for the benefit of the children. And every Monday we are there with Bible studies, with capoeira classes, and, and then we... We also have a meal for the kids. We found out that most of the kids are really hungry, you know. So we're just making meals for them now. And, and we go there every Monday and once a month on Saturdays. Our goal is to have more opportunities to go there more times during the week, you know, to have like English classes, to have... Uh, to help them to do their homework, to help the parents. So I'd love to ask you guys to continue to pray, you know, for our ministry, for our financial provision. God is doing a beautiful work there in the city of God. And, and just so that you know, some of the upcoming events, um, October 7, we have the Children's, Children's Day in Brazil. So we're going to have like the Jesus film and some waffles for the kids and then November 2nd we're gonna have the the capoeira festival where every kid is gonna receive their own capoeira pants and the t-shirt so that they can have their own like capoeira outfit for the classes 
And our main event is coming in December that we call the Blessed Christmas. It's where we adopt a child, like let's say like we sponsor a child with a pair of clothes and a gift and a toy. And, and we give each one of the kids a toy. We have about like 60 kids in one place and, and 40 kids in the other place that we minister to. At the plaza, the praça, you know. So we have about a hundred kids. So it's a big challenge, but God is big, and I want to thank you guys so much for your prayers and support. And to know that we have churches and people that are thinking about and praying for us in the ministry here in Brazil. Thank you so much. God bless. Yeah, for Pastor Alex, you know, being right there and um, ministering and and he's you know what's really great about pastor alex is his fellowship and i think we have a cover screen here of just like a just a snapshot of their fellowship and if uh and the group of people there i mean you know as they come together and as they meet and as they fellowship together uh they realize you know for pastor alex he said the biggest thing is not folks coming to the church building it's us going out into the community us going out into the favelas, into the slums. Uh, with such a large portion of Rio, you know, something I think like 30 to 40% of the population of Rio lives in the slums. And so to go out into the slums, and there's a, a lot of uh, um, conflict that happens there uh, as well. When we came back, um, Pastor Alex wanted us to know, we could put up that picture of that building really quick. I mean, the building, you know, it's, it's not much to look at, but I mean, just think about this, this process, right? The government of Brazil built it, didn't finish it, the drug dealers took it over, and then gave it to people who will teach kids about Jesus. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's like one of those things where you just go, and, and, you know, it's like, well, that's not much. Remember, God does a lot with not much, right? And so, and, and you know, did you say bulletproof? You're exactly right. So, Part of the safety and, you know, our mindset, we don't think this way, but for the kids to be safe. Right now, we've entered into fall, they're entering into spring, and summer's coming. When we visited, we visited in the dead of winter, you know, and the humidity was already up there, and the temperature was in the 80s. The, the, the Brazilians themselves, the people in Rio said, it's miserable here in the summertime. And so for the kids to come from outside into a building that's much better than being outside, but then for the safety... Because there'll be a shootout in the city of God once a week. That's not an unusual thing. For the police to storm in, for the drug dealers to rally, and, and for bullets to be exchanged, for people to die. I think it's a, a, like 1,075 people have died in the city of God or in, in the slums in Rio since January of this year. Of this year. And so this be, just becomes part of life for them. So for them, this, this building I don't know what you see when you see this, but when they see this building, they just see it as a refuge that God has provided. And so then it's a matter of like, okay, well, it's not much to work with. Yeah, but it's something, and we're going to make the most of what God has provided and given to us. So when we went a few months ago, you know, we just were like, you know, what's, what's, do you think the cost would be to help um, at least get that one room? There's this one room where you saw a lot of the kids gathering. That was the room the drug dealer said, well, you can have this room here. And you saw there's a reinforced door put up, locks put up, any like viewing window that was in that door was, there was a piece of metal welded on it so that somebody didn't try to break into that. And if bullets do start flying, the kids are safe inside that structure. It's, it's, it's a refuge for them. It allows ministry to continue in a place where ministry is extremely challenging. And so, you know, it's like, well, how much do you think it'll cost? Well, it'll be about $1,000 to get lights put in and to get some of these doors and to get some of these things. And so as a church, you have already, that has already been sent to them and those things have already been used. And so within like a week or two after that, they already started using this building. So they're using it now every week. And then... It goes on and he says, um, we have now been given the use of four rooms. So it started out with one room is, well, you can also have this room and you can also use that room and you can also use this room. So the drug dealers are seeing that there's a beneficial effect happening and that the kids are being taken care of. You know, you, you, the police can't walk, like the police can't just um, walk on that street or, or, or show up here because bullets will start flying. Christians can go there, though. 
If you show up and you're like, well, we're Christians and we're with this person, this pastor who's been serving here for a couple years and this other person who lives here and you know them and they're like, yeah, you're fine. They'll put their guns down and they'll let you come in and they'll let you serve. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and there was a point, um, I'm glad you brought that up, Jim. There's a point near the end of what, the day that we, were, we spent in the city of God where you, know, you heard like a bottle rocket go off or something like that. But as I roll it back in my mind, I, there, I didn't hear any fireworks all day long. And it was near the end of the day, we wanted to get out before the sun set because both the temperature changes, but also the climate changes spiritually when the sun goes down. And so we wanted to get out. So it was about three o'clock in the afternoon. We had, you know, a couple hours before the sun was going to set easy. And so we started to work our way. And then all of a sudden you hear this, you know, pop, you know, kind of a sound. I was like, oh, firework. But then I don't speak Portuguese or understand Portuguese well, but for those that were with us, and if we can go to the staff picture, Don, um, for those that were witness, Pastor Alex is there. Vanessa, she lives, uh, she's in the front here wearing the black. She, she lives there in the city of God. She knows uh, so many people there in the city of God. And she's, she walked us into their homes, these shacks, and she knew them all by name. And she was ministering to her. I was like, preach. You just share the word with her. Like, you know, and she was just such an encouragement. So she's right there. Bayana, who's sitting behind Pastor Alex, who's waving back there. Bayana is the one who's leading the capoeira classes, which is like this dancing um, uh, jujitsu kind of a thing. And he talked about, you know, giving the kids capoeira pants. It, you would look at it, it's like white pants and like, it looks almost like it looks like a martial arts kind of a thing. But for these kids to have something go, I'm a part of this thing. It teaches them discipline. It gives them a way to focus their energy rather than towards destructive means. And so as a church, every month, we, su we support Bayana uh, every single month who's standing, who's, who's back there as she continues to minister in that way. Um, the, some of that food that you saw there, this is just how amazing it is. So for $100, we could provide food for Bayana to feed those kids twice a week for a month. For $100. We're like, that's, yeah, that's, like, that's not, we're not even, that, yes, that's done. That's a done, it's a done deal. We're doing that. And so... These are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so for us to be praying for them, I wanted you to see their faces. I wanted you to get, just get a little bit to know them a little bit more. And as the months and years go on, you'll hear more updates as well. I just wanted to fill in some of these things for you. But um, what I'd been talking about was with the, um, all the things that were happening, you know, the simple daily walking from one place to another. Vanessa, when she heard the, what you know, I thought was a bottle rocket, was, was just a gunshot into the air. And what it was is to warn everybody in the city of God that the police are getting ready to do a raid. And so at that point, you see all the guys with their semi-automatics and their AKs all running in a direction. At which point, you know, between Bayana and Vanessa and others, they're like, okay, we're going to take a shortcut. And in my mind, I'm like, we're in the city of God and we're going to take a shortcut. And you're totally trusting the people that you're with. And you're going between alley to alley and you see guys on motorcycles and, you know, got their guns as they're heading someplace. And you're like, all right, as long as we're not going the way they're going. And, uh, and as we took this walk, it was about a 15 minute walk to get outside into a place that was less of a potential area of conflict. And you could just see for Vanessa, for Bayana and others, they're just like, Pastor Alex, a real, he's a real like relaxed kind of personality. And you would love him if you, you met him face to face. But that was the one moment where he's like, guys, we got we to gotta, gotta walk. Got to walk faster now. Now, just keep walking. Don't slow down. Keep walking. And to realize this, that that was just one day of us being there, that's every day for them who live there. That's every day for them, the potential for that to happen. There's um, the, the police there, it's not like the police here. They're very, they're militarized there. And, you know, there's things, there's accusations of them dropping grenades from helicopters into the city of God, of taking armored vehicles and driving through buildings in the city of God. So then those in the city of God, and, and I don't want to paint this picture like everybody in the city of God is like doing great. They're drug dealers. They set up road barricades, and that's why the police can't enter into the city of God. So there's like this tension that almost on a weekly basis, stuff happens. So then things were being ramped up, stray bullets kill people all the time. There's no discrimination as to who's getting shot. And that's why they said, if bullets start going, just hit the ground and just keep your head down. Because they're not going to go, oh, are you American? Can we see your passport? Th none of that's going to happen. I want to show you this news um, 
clip, this video, if we can play this, we'll probably have to do the VLC thing and bring it up on the, over this uh, image here. But um, this was from Brazilian news of a raid that had happened just three weeks ago. And uh, Pastor Alex had sent it to us, and he's just going, this is the kind of stuff that Vanessa was telling us about. So we can play this. Um, and you'll have to hide the front top screen. So, so I mean, I'll kind of narrate. So, so a, a military, a, a police vehicle like that, driving through houses in the city of God, um, cries of the people. There's children that are sleeping there. People get killed all the time, and so the despair, the pain. And you see, the, you see society breaking apart. So then those in the city of God started to bring a bunch of trash out and start to cause a smoke screen in the streets all around this area of the city of God. Then they began to commandeer vehicles, just started to tell people, get off this bus. Everybody get off the bus. We're taking the bus. And they took buses and construction vehicles and started to blockade all the roads to prevent the police from coming back in. And, uh, and you'll see a wider shot of like, they're just commandeering bus after bus, telling people, go ahead and get off the bus here. And you see them all up that street, all the way up the street, and just using them to, to try to blockade fuel trucks, whatever it is. So we have brothers and sisters that are ministering in these conditions. And you are having an effect on the gospel being preached because the gospel can't be stopped. It cannot be stopped even in challenging situations like that. But I wanted to bring a little bit of perspective of what they go through. And in that, and in all those things that are happening too, Pastor Alex did say something, and I want to read this to you. He said, um, he said that there's a lot of spiritual warfare going, going on these days. He said there's a lot of spiritual warfare. Funny that I was just reading that, huh? Let me read that again. There's a lot of spiritual warfare going on these days. Demonic activity and spiritual darkness. Clearly, you don't have to be in Brazil to experience that, right? So then um, Andre from, from our church inquired a little bit and was like, you know, Pastor Alex, can you, can you tell us a little bit more about what's going on? And he said... Um, he showed a picture of a boy and he said, his name is Wallace, one of several kids from the city of God who is now going to school because of our social work. He lives in one of those little houses we visited. Tonight, I'm going to do a Bible study with our staff at the city of God to talk to them about spiritual warfare and to encourage the group to keep their eyes on Jesus. The city of God is going through confrontations almost every day. The police are going inside all the time and battles intensify a lot. Some of our people are having nightmares and dreams that are battling for their minds and their heart. He mentions uh, one woman here, and he said that she had a dream where she saw demonic spirits really angry at her and not willing for us to go forward into reaching to the children with the love of God. God showed this woman this picture, and it was her giving birth to kids, and Satan was trying to kill the children, which for her was representing those children in the city of God. In other words, we're reaching out to kids and families, and Satan wants to destroy and he has a big dominion over that area. See, the thing, though, is because of the cross, Satan has already been defeated. Yes, so there's some battles going on right now, but we know the ultimate outcome, how it's all going. And so the thing is, is how should we engage in spiritual warfare if we actually know how it's all going to turn out? See, it's not like we should enter into, spiritual war, you know, into this prayer against spiritual warfare and just go, or towards the, you know, the, the demonic powers and spiritual darkness in our world. We don't have to go into it going, oh no, I don't know how it's going to turn out. We know how it turns out. So we should pray and engage in, in this spiritual warfare through prayer and through service of others, knowing with confidence how it ends up. And I just want to encourage you to do that. So even when you see things, I know that we can get moments. I didn't show you that so you'd get discouraged. I, want to, I just wanted you to show you that so when you see brothers and sisters in Christ, they with joy, with the joy of the Lord before them, will for their own, you know, their safety is at risk, but they love those people so much that they'll go in again and again and again. And kids are being fed the word of God. Kids are being fed food. 
Kids are having help with their homework so that they don't perpetuate a cycle where they end up back and the drug dealer snatch them up early and just go, hey, listen, you know, forget school. Why don't you just come with us? And so I just want to encourage you, church, that God is doing a great work. Um, My prayer is, and I don't know this for sure, but this is the prayer is that we would go back to Brazil in 2020. And um, I couldn't couldn't really ask the church to, to pray about going to Brazil and to set aside the resources to go to Brazil if I hadn't gone myself. And so it was really important. So what you see here is you see a a church family. And you know what? They speak a different language than we do, but they're not unlike us. They're not unlike us. And so I just want um, you to know so that God could continue to knit our hearts together as we, we pray for those. So yes, may the Lord use us in this little fellowship here in Humboldt County to reach the people right here in our backyard. Absolutely. But let's not just limit our sights here because there's a whole world of people. And for some, I have no doubt. I mean, two young ladies are being, are heading out to New Zealand you know, um, and, and no doubt there'll be others that'll be sent out all over our world from this little fellowship here, but we need to be praying for them that they would have a heart after that. So it's eight o'clock and that's what I wanted to share with you guys this evening. Thank you for coming. If you would agree with me in a word of prayer, let's just, let's just close. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. God, God's hand of protection. Yeah. And God, God's not done with Humboldt County. He's not, he's not giving this place up to the enemy. And we as believers shouldn't be like, ah, it's just Humboldt. No. Mm-mm. Our God loves the people of this community. Would you agree with me in prayer? Papa, as we come before you this evening, thank you so much. Whether it's North America or South America or anywhere else on this planet, God, you are aware of what's going on. And I thank you, God, that you have positioned your sons and daughters all over this world. I thank you personally for those that you have stationed here in Humboldt County. Thank you, God, that you've called us to serve with one another and to serve the people of our community. I pray that we would be absolutely sacrificial like you were sacrificial for us. I pray that we would be sacrificial for the people around us. I pray, as Taylor and Cole had shared, that we wouldn't stereotype people just based on our limited knowledge of what we know of them, but rather we would ask you for your eyes and your heart, more importantly, as we encounter people day by day. I pray for the person that was vocal just a few minutes ago. Lord, clearly something is stirring, and you love that person. You're crazy about that person. Lord, I pray that, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to that person in a way that they understand so that they would realize they don't have to be at war with you. They don't have to fight you. They can be at peace with God because you made a way for us to be at peace with you. We pray for our brothers and sisters all around the world. I pray for those at the camp um, in British Columbia at Beyond Malibu. Pray for those who have been faithfully serving there year after year. And God, we pray that the ministry would continue and lives would be changed. That as they come off the mountain, they would enter back into the world with renewed um, purpose and the power from the Holy Spirit. And in South America, we pray for people like Pastor Alex and Vanessa and Bayana and so many others, those dear kids and their parents. We pray for that community in the city of God. We pray for the police officers. We pray for the government of Brazil. God, we just pray for a broken world. We pray for the King of Kings to come and intervene. We thank you for your, for your protection. We thank you for your oversight in our lives. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 God bless you guys. Again, thank you so much for coming tonight. And... Uh, those snacks are not going to eat themselves, so please help yourself. And I, there's a cookie there with my name. Did you? Are you kidding me? You didn't eat the cookie? Seriously, I did. Wow, wow. Thank you.